the criminal justice system has been weaponized. to achieve an external purpose and for an ulterior motive. Secondly, I'm just summarizing the grounds under which we, we, we want to address you and to seek then directions from you that you cannot proceed with this matter in view of the objections that we are raising. That on the face of it, looking at the charges this is not a criminal prosecution, and when the evidence will be put before the appropriate forum, it will emerge that a contractual transaction, a purely commercial transaction, has been criminalized. And it's a transaction that took place more than five, nearly five years ago. So it is like a nuclear bomb. This is a nuclear option to look for any material that will be used to drag the Deputy Chief Justice into this trial. Thirdly, we are going to demonstrate that there's no factual foundation. There's no factual foundation for instituting these charges against the Deputy Chief Justice. Fourthly, we are going to demonstrate that these proceedings are an abuse of the process of the court. And that matters which naturally fall within the province of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. And every case, including the ones you have dealt with, were, were investigated and the recommendations given for prosecution by the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission on the face of the charge sheet, although these are corruption-related offenses under the Anti-Corruption Act. These charges have been brought by the police, and we are going to demonstrate why the deputy, uh, the director of public prosecution on this matter chose to use the director of criminal investigations who turned out to be user friendly as opposed to using the legal regime, the statutory regime that relates to offenses created under the Anti-Corruption Act and the, for the purposes for which this court has been established as an anti-corruption act. Otherwise, for normal penal code cases, we would have gone before court number one. Finally, amongst other reasons which uh, probably we may not need to advance for purposes of uh, uh, pursuing uh, your honor, that this matter should not be taken, uh, a plea should not be taken, is that despite the fact that this matter has the action complained of in the charge sheets took place nearly five years ago in a space of five hours yesterday, both accused, uh, the, the first accused 
was arrested. Taken to the director of criminal investigations. And by 5 o'clock, 5.30, we are before your lordship, your honor. This, that is an unusual uh, efficiency. Very unusual. <laughs> For those of us who practice in this court. Now, Your Honor, I want to persuade you that you should not be in a hurry. to require the accused person to take plea. And by that, I'm guided by the authority of a judge of the High Court, Justice Nyakundi. I'll give you a copy. In, in my reading of the law in relation to taking of pleas, there is a case that is familiar to this court, Adan versus the Republic. I think there is no case that advanced the need and the process of a careful consideration of a plea, other than uh, more than Adan versus the Republic. <coughs> During the phase in which Kenya faced uh, a lot of political headwinds, and people were being taken, uh, being arrested and kept in custody for more than 60 days, brought to court, at night and forced to take a plea in order to address that mischief. The Court of Appeal came with another very important <coughs> issue, the case of Odiambo Olel versus the Republic. And in that case, the Court of Appeal pointed out that at the time of the plea taking, the court has a responsibility. It's not a matter that should be left to an accused person. It's not a matter to be left to the advocates. But the courts also have a responsibility. Your Honor, it may have been thought that we are better persons and uh, more obedient to the rule of law and respectful the Bill of Rights so that we had a case like Adan versus the Republic. But even during the colonial period, there was another case, Tambu Kiza versus Unyonga. This is before independence. A decision of the Supreme Court of Kenya, which later on became the Court of Appeal. In 1958, this is what this court is saying, uh, holding number two. If I may invite your honor to look at the holding number two. <clears throat> the whole object of section 89 of the criminal procedure code 
and of the subsequent sections dealing with the framing of charges is that before a trial can be held, the accused must be arraigned before the court on a formal charge which must comply with the provisions of the criminal procedure court. If there is no charge, then there is nothing in which there can be an error, omission, or an irregularity. What the court is saying <coughs> that you must be satisfied that there is a charge. And in fact, it is for this provision, provision section 89, subsection 9, you would then be required to admit the charge. The court is required to admit the charge after consideration of the charge. <laughs> so, Your Honor, in relation to now the authority that I've placed before you, and I'm looking at page 6. Which one? The one of Tubukiza or the one of the, the, the one I, I gave you earlier. Joshua Giri. Giri, Giri Page six. Yeah. <clears throat> well, well Your Honor, I, I think this is a very important case for purposes of the development of the law. Because it is saying that before a plea can be taken, an accused person is entitled not only to the charge sheet in advance, but is also entitled to the evidence before a plea can be taken. So looking at the material, that has been given to an accused person as evidence, and looking at the charge, an accused person can then make an informed decision as to whether to plead guilty or not to plead guilty. Your Honor, I want to persuade you that this procedure has very long history. In England, before the Magna Carta, there emerged a mechanism which found itself in common law jurisdictions, including our own jurisdiction, the idea of having a pre-trial process so that before you take an accused person to court, there is a determination as to whether there is a proper charge and there is sufficiency of evidence. Not sufficient for det determination of guilt or innocence, but to make sure that somebody is not being dragged to court on trumped up charges. So in England, Imagine a practice which is there in the United States of a grand jury and a petit jury. The grand jury will look at the accusation and the evidence before the matter is taken for trial on the termination by the grand jury that the state is not dragging somebody to court on trumped up charges. And the other would know that in relation to the capital office offenses that are tribal by the High Court, including murder and treason, <coughs> Normally, there, was, there were what are called committal proceedings that went before a magistrate, and the magistrate would make a decision as to whether there is sufficiency 
of evidence at the proper charge for the matter to be taken to the High Court for trial. Those committed proceedings used to be almost <coughs> a full trial. Justice Nyakundi seemed to have gotten the point that because we do not have a grand jury and a petite jury, he spells out what the accused person must be, what must be available to the accused person before a plea is taken. <clears throat> and uh, he cites uh, a case from Malaysia which was adopted with approval in a Kenyan case. The relevant of the uh, part of the Kenyan, uh, the, the part relied on in the judgment is found under the citation of those two cases. And if you may allow me to read what it says. If the right to be had is to be a real right which is worth anything, it must carry with it a right in the accused person to know the case which is made against him. He must know what evidence has been given and what statements have been made affecting him. And then he must be given a fair opportunity to correct or contradict them. In principle, the evidence together with the charges must be produced in advance and supplied to the accused before his call upon to answer. So this uh, cowboy tactics that we used yesterday of dragging somebody in the office, I'm allowed you, you already could see what they intend to give us as statements. The Deputy Chief Justice is supposed to answer to the documents you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> or a similar <laughs> <laughs> now, for, for an accused person, this is what the, the, the is saying, Nyakundi is saying, before you can elect to give an informed plea, you don't just need, you don't just need a statement of the offense and the particulars. You need the evidence so that you can say, okay, it looks like they got me on this one. <coughs> so the best part is for me to plea bargain, there are provisions for plea bargain. <laughs> or uh, outrightly uh, enter a plea of, of guilty. Now, consequently, where an accused person, uh, now she is talking about a conviction, where there has been a conviction. and goes through that if a conviction is entered in circumstances where there has been no sufficient opportunity to be given accused person prior to an indictment, then those kind of proceedings would offend Article 50, sub-Article 2 of the Constitution. The right to a fair here Fair hearing does not mean dragging somebody to court. It means that the whole edict of the law must be adhered to. And then in the middle of this passage, it says, I can think of no possible rationale. This is a judge who rose through the ranks. 
<coughs> and it's talking out of experience. I can think of no possible rationale at all why accused persons charged with various offenses are not allowed an opportunity to produce the charge sheet together with the witness statements before being invited to answer the charge. So what is the judge saying? That an accused person should <coughs> get all the statements before the charge. And he says, this the court is doing because the court is the defender of the Bill of Rights. And that is contained in Article 19 of the Constitution. There is nobody, no person in Kenya who cannot follow the Bill of Rights. As read with Article 2, Article 10 of the Constitution, we are obligated so, my, my, my Lord, Your Honor, one of the provisions we are going to, to address is the question of the rights under Article 50, sub Article 2 of the Constitution. And I can, I'm posing the question Does Your Honor have the jurisdiction to hear and determine <coughs> a complaint properly placed before you on violation of Article 2, of Article 50, sub Article 2. We are shortly going to give you an answer to that question. <coughs> and that is that arises from from the Majesty's Act. You want to refer me to section 8? Uh, I'm coming to the bunch to section 8. Okay. Let, let me leave it. <laughs> but you can submit on it. Yeah, but I want to submit on it because there's an authority here we want to refer to. Uh, Your Honor, the criminal, the Majesty's Act, yeah, section 8. does give the court jurisdiction to hear and determine applications for redress for denial or violation or infringement of threat to a right or a fundamental freedom in the Bill of Rights. But states that in subsection two of that section eight, it, that jurisdiction only relates to article 25, sub article, at sub, at sub article 25 <coughs> A and B deals with torture and slippery. That is the jurisdiction that is granted before uh, to this court. And that is normal. Even the High Court cannot step on a presidential petition, election petition. So all courts, including the Supreme Court, have jurisdiction which is created by the law. But while addressing that question of Article 25, it is important to note that the right to a fair trial is <coughs> not derogable. And that means when a complaint is raised on the question of fair trial, 
it must be dealt with. <coughs> but it can only be dealt with by a court of competent jurisdiction. Now, my lord, the conundrum is that the Constitution says you must apply the Constitution, you must apply the law in making a decision. Every person, every state organ, including this court, must apply the Constitution. So when a matter is brought before you in which you have no jurisdiction, then in applying the law, you would determine and locate where that jurisdiction is and let the court with jurisdiction deal with that matter. And it's not any matter, it's a matter affecting fair trial which is non-derogable. And non derogable in circumstances where Article 19 give a constitutional fiat that the Bill of Rights is an integral part of Kenya, Kenya's democratic state. So the moment we do not deal with that question, then you are undermining the very foundational principle under which this republic is established. So, but not what we are saying is that uh, you should not hurry to take the plea You should not destroy the file. <coughs> but what you should be telling us, that since you have filed a petition, <coughs> can you go before the court of competent jurisdiction to deal with that question? Once that question is answered, <coughs> then you can come back with a determination. And uh, the High Court has dealt with a question like this arising out of election. <coughs> this is case uh, miscellaneous civil application number 305 2017. Uh, it was an application by way of JR. Uh, the ex party applicant was one Susan Hika Wakarura. And, what I'm, and uh, the parties are there. But the provisions, the, the part of the judgment that I want to refer to you without taking too much time. Is that from page seven to eight, where the question of jurisdiction is addressed uh, why the High Court? We want to persuade you to apply the applicable principles or propositions which are made in this judgment. And, my Lord, you, you, you Honor, you note. That uh, in the judgment in, on page 5, paragraph 30, there's a reference to the case of owners of the motor vessel Lillian versus Caltech Oil Kenya Limited. At the site, the, the law report, the relevant law report is given a decision which has been unimpeached. From the time it was made, 
up to now. Where the judges are more particularly just Nyerangi. Said, and this has been followed by the courts here, that jurisdiction is everything. You either have it or you don't. And if you don't have it, you down your tools. So we want to persuade the court that on this matter you are raising, we must down our tools. Downing tools is not taking away tools. It's not a sign of a derogation, but it's just downing the tools. And Your Honor, the commentary by, by, by Justice Odunga in this matter, in paragraph 37, 38, 39, <coughs> 40, and this is a matter in relation to a tribunal, and he was saying that even if the tribunal had to apply the constitution, he can only apply that constitution or interpret that constitution in relation to a matter in which the tribunal had jurisdiction. So we are, we, are, we are saying that this is a matter in which you do not have jurisdiction. Now, the other issue that uh, we are raising, which I, I put out in summary, is that chapter six of the Constitution is a very important creation an innovation in our constitution which talks to matters integrity, leadership and integrity. Now, under that chapter, parliament is directed in Article 79 to enact legislation to establish an independent ethics and the anti-corruption commission, which shall have the status and powers of a commission under chapter 15. I'm a lot, if you look at Article 249 of the Constitution, particularly 249.2, the commissions and the holders of independent offices are only subject to this Constitution as a law, are independent and not subject to direction or control by any person or authority. There's a, a constitutional requirement that the commission shall not be directed or controlled. My Lord, if you look at Article 157 of the Constitution, which relates to the powers of the Director of Public uh, Prosecution, It says in Article 4, uh, uh, sub Article 4, the Director of Public Prosecution shall have power to direct the Inspector General of the National Police Service to investigate any in information or allegation of criminal conduct, and the Inspector General shall comply with any such direction. So under our constitutional arrangement, the only person 
or office that the director of public prosecution can direct or give orders in respect of investigations of a criminal conduct is the inspector general. <coughs> now, unfortunately, my, for the director of public prosecution, if you look at the charges <coughs> in the charge sheet, they relate to offenses provided for under the Ethics and the Anti-Corruption Act. Yes, um, and the honor just to address this point, the uh, statute which talks to the creation of the commission by an act of parliament enacted in compliance with Article 79 of the Constitution, Section 28, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission Act says, and it speaks of independence of the commission, except as provided in the Constitution and in this act, the commission shall, in the performance of its function, not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. So the case that we want to make, which is about abuse of process and lack of fair hearing is that the director of public prosecutions capriciously malafides and with ill motive has taken these matters to the director of criminal investigations because he knows that that's where he can give directives as opposed to the commission. <coughs> and <coughs> the prop proposition that we want to advance to your honor <laughs> is that insofar as the chapter dealing with leadership and integrity in the Constitution, and the enactment of ethics and anti-corruption commission is for purposes of dealing with matters that relate to corruption <coughs> and the economic crimes, which we all agree must be dealt with. <coughs> but because they relate to public officers and state officers, <coughs> in order to ensure that not every accusation that is brought on board is rushed to court. Offenses that relate to the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission are to be investigated by that commission. And they do that without direction from anybody. The functions of the commission in the act, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission uh, is found in uh, uh, section 11, 1D. In addition to the functions of the commission under article 252 and chapter six of the constitution, the commission <coughs> shall investigate and recommend to the director of public prosecution of any acts of corruption or violation of codes of ethics. So the director of prosecution was telling the commission, don't waste my time. I'm going to deal with this my way. But the law does not allow him to do it, do it his way because the Ethics and anti corruption Commission Act has a full regime. Code of law that relates to investigations 
particularly to the offenses which I created under that act, section 45, 46, and so on, I created under the anti-corruption and the Economic Crimes Act. What is important in that? It is important, first of all, you would notice that the commissions are given the power of the police, they can investigate, they can arrest. There are many other alternatives, mechanism, asset seizure, requirements for explanation of assets. And because the, this has got to do with the integrity of public officers. Section 33 requires that no person except with the leave of the director or with other lawful excuse disclose the details of, end of an investigation under this act, including the identity of anyone being investigated. Now, everybody in Kenya knew that the Deputy Chief Justice was being investigated before even the director talked about it. You can see uh, headlines. She has fallen. How is this information getting out there before even the director or public prosecution has said anything about it? <coughs> This is the protection that was put in this act to ensure that whereas we require our public officers to be guided by the dictates of chapter 6, in doing so, they should not be bashed around. Which is what is happening in this matter, with respect. And at the end of the investigation, what is the commission required to do? Section 35. Following an investigation, the commission shall report to the director of the public prosecution on the results of the investigation. Two, the commission's report shall include any recommendation the commission may have that a person be prosecuted for corruption or economic crime. Now, this is an economic crime. <coughs> corruption. You can see the sections referred to uh, basically falling under that act. And the work of the commission <coughs> is subject to quarterly reports which have to be given to Parliament, to the President, for examination so that they are accountable in some form or shape. So we are saying under the circumstances in which the Director of Public Prosecution has cherry-picked which institution to use for the purposes of this case, we are saying it is not for nothing, it's for a malicious purpose, it's malafides. And it's to deny the accused persons an opportunity to confront even the allegations that have been made. You know, for example, in count two, we have an answer. to show that <coughs> whereas uh, that uh, the, the accused number one through the lawyer gave a professional undertaking to pay, to pay 
the loan <laughs> and replace a title after <coughs> a, discharge, a discharge. The, the, the lawyer gives two undertakings. Pay the money, give an alternative title. The bank does not wait for that. As soon as she has paid 65 billion, he says, have your title. I know Malang friends, with respect, to say that's a matter of evidence. And I'm saying it purposely because that is the evidence we want to place before the High Court to show that these charges are a sham. And your, your Honor, while at it, I want to share, and I'm not seeing this as an authority, as it were, but one of the most famous judges in America, in the Supreme Court, was a judge by the name Justice Frankfurter. He served in the Supreme Court Frank Futter. His name is spelled Frank and then F U R T E R. <coughs> Him and uh, colleagues in the Supreme Court were involved at a time when the United States was dealing with a war situation, the Second World War and the war in Korea. And the executive felt the president. Truman felt that in a war situation, the executive can do anything in defense of the country. <coughs> they, even, they even took possession of steel mills. They said, we, have, we want to produce weapons. And these companies are not doing it fast enough. We are taking over these steel mills. So, the words of Frankfurter that I want to share with the court, he says that uh, the dangerous power which is accumulated by a government